Welcome everybody, this is Tim Watrous, President of Digital Advisors. And this is Kevin Gordon, President of Capital Advisors Group. We'd like to welcome you to our K-12 Politics and Tech video series. Our objective is to give you the absolute latest of what's going on in Sacramento that affects public school districts, obviously, and as well as all the technology stuff that's going on that's so vital to delivering for kids these days. And remember, if you find these videos useful, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel and share out over social media. You're our marketing team. We appreciate your support. And let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Tim Watrous, President of Digital Advisors, back with an epi another episode of K-12 Politics and Tech. As always, Kevin Gordon, President of Capital Advisors, joining us again. Kevin, glad to have you here. Got some big news today. <laughs> Ah, and uh, we good news, and we need a lot of it. So looking forward to that. Um, and also, we have Randy Bassett, uh, superintendent of Fontana USD, used to work for uh, for private tech companies, was a tech director, chief business officer, uh, superintendent, the exact normal path of a superintendent, but uh, kind of a unicorn of superintendents. Randy, glad to have you here. Great to be here, Tim. Thanks for letting me share. Absolutely. And uh, Kevin, you said it, there is some wonderful news out of Sacramento this week. Uh, amidst all the other turmoil we've been facing, it's nice to see some good news. Can you tell us a little bit about what came out of the Legislative Analyst Office and what that means for schools? Yeah, so we're used to this time every year, the nonpartisan Legislative Analysts releasing a report that includes an economic forecast that gives us some near-term kinds of observations, but also some out-year projections. and. I think a lot of people were very surprised, but you know, when you really look at the underlying sort of assumptions that that they're looking at, um, there isn't as big a surprise. It's just it's just not intuitive to see the incredible revenue growth that the state has seen compared to what was anticipated, and um, and like Jerry Shelton and our team likes to say, it's not revenue growth; it's it's just revenue beyond we ever thought we were gonna get in terms of the estimates. So we have, what they're basically forecasting is $4 billion better off in 1920, $34 billion off better off uh, in 2021. And, and obviously overall revenue, what it's driven by are you know, the very rich people, the disproportionate um, impact of the way our revenue system is in California on very rich people is ending up benefiting at us, us through this, but it also underscores that the economic pain, the hardship is really at the lower levels. So as people that are at the sort of middle income and lower level, they're not affecting state tax revenue as much because they don't pay as much. So it's all at that upper end and the upper end is doing just remarkably well. So you take a look at overall revenues and one of the things that we noted is that between August and October, a 9% increase over the same period last year. We're talking about in a COVID environment, 9% up over the same period last year, 22% up over what was in the June budget estimate when they adopted the budget. So all of that translates into, you know, one-time money of about $13.7 billion that would materialize potentially for the governor to have if he accepts some of the assumptions the LAO is using, $4.2 billion of ongoing funding that would be available. So amongst the recommendations, and in fact, this came out the day before the LAO announced, I think the President Pro Tem of the Senate, Tony Atkins, was excited by the news and couldn't contain herself. So instead of waiting till after the report came out, the night before, she released a statement saying, look, at this is going to look way better than we expected. And and had a list of priorities. The top item on the list of priorities was revisiting Prop 98 and the deferrals that we did to say, let's, let's back out of all of these. And what the LAO is basically saying in its report is we can essentially undo all of the deferrals that we've done so far. So that is particularly good news to not have to do those deferrals. They even referenced the ability to fund a COLA in the fiscal year that starts next June. It's very small, 1.14% COLA, but you know, just complete reversal of the crisis as, as we were meeting it um, beginning in February and March, um, and then obviously what happened in the overall budget. It, it, it backs off of a lot of, I think, the potential anxiety that we're all having in public schools across the state 
about if we were borrowing to these unbelievably unprecedented amounts in deferrals, $12.5 billion across K-12 and community colleges. That is the total amount of deferrals that we did over the entire Great Recession. We were doing it in one year. That if we had sustained problems, would we do even more deferrals next year? And to have this go in completely the opposite direction where we're erasing the deferrals potentially, if the governor goes there, um, that we're doing now and end up actually in a positive uh, position, that would just be great. And then obviously the outlook going forward is one we have to be careful about, but their outlook is even good estimating increases just in the basic Prop 98 guarantee growth of at least $2 billion per year throughout their forecast period beyond these numbers I've talked about. So lots of incredible news. And, you know, I can't help but call on Randy because as a former CBO and as a current superintendent, <clears throat> and you've juggled a lot of numbers in your time, um, this, this had to be a surprise, right? It definitely was a surprise. Of course, when we see numbers like that, we look, look at it with an asterisk on the side. And we look at it with cautious optimism, but really look at where we're heading in the future. So I automatically go to what is the look at those out years as you start to address as well. But it's really what does generate those these types of things. And this is a time when it's great to be California and have the Silicon Valley in California to help generate some of those revenues. As we've done those shifts and all of our school districts have done the shifts to moving online, there's a benefit to that as far as those resources, but right. it allows us to send some normalcy heading into the future. That big top line number, that 13.7 billion that the LAO identifies as potentially one-time money would evaporate by paying down these deferrals. So, I mean, again, we haven't done all of them, but essentially reversing out the deferrals costs you across K-14, $12.5 billion. Um, but then there's this, uh, that's ongoing money. So. One of the things I know you're used to, and we'll talk about it a little bit later as we talk about technology again, is that people need to be careful that when they see a big number that says one time, it doesn't mean that you can go out and start spending, particularly spending in the way of, you know, permanent ongoing obligations. This gets us out of the hole that we have found ourselves in, um, and then modest growth going forward. Uh, so we'll 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 wait to see. The other thing that, you know, you're right about Randy is that. You know, this is an LAO report. The LAO report, the legislative analyst has no power other than the dispense information. It's what does the governor do with it? And then what does the legislature do? So that's why it was really encouraging me to me to see the Senate president representing the Democrats in the Senate, which now have, oh my gosh, upwards of 75% of the membership um, or, or more. Um, say that their number one priority is going to be revisiting these deferrals and getting that stuff straightened out. So, and that's somebody that has some power and can do something about it. So sort of leading up to where, where the governor will go, um, he's kind of getting chased into a corner about what he might actually do with this. We're hoping that what they don't do is something less conservative or less sort of budget savvy and go spend money on new things when what they ought to do is, is pay down the debt and pay off these, deferrals that they walked into. I, and I'm confident the governor will do it. He's gonna be going into an election cycle. Um, he wants to emulate Jerry Brown in terms of the fiscal soundness of the state. That's, that's what kind of strikes me. Um, any other thoughts that you have, Randy? I think as we've headed through this crisis, we've made so many adjustments and those, as we'll talk about later, have have led into some of those what may turn into ongoing costs. So it still means cautious optimism moving forward, but we still have to account for where we're going to be heading. What are those costs that have been have come on? And if this is really one time money, it still means that we have increased costs with static um, funding. So yeah. in the end, we need to be cautious. That it's a great point. Is that one of the things they have in the report is their anticipation of a 1.4% COLA. Well, remember, that's based on a formula back in Washington, D.C., that COLA, and it has nothing to do with the increased costs that we have in the state for public schools, nothing. So when you think about, like you said, the increased costs that we have for the infrastructure that we're building up and technology alone, that that has to be replaced every three years, right? And, and there's... 
there's just so many dimensions of increased costs that we have in California that that COLA does not reflect. That I go back to a pre-COVID kind of mantra that I kept talking about, which is that we need to revisit how our COLA is determined for K-12 in California because the COLA has traditionally just been absolutely inadequate. And if and it leads people to believe when they say you're getting a COLA that you're keeping up with the pace of increased costs that we have as LEAs, and it just does not. So super good point. Um, hey, Kevin, quick yeah. question for you. Uh, yeah. We were preparing for this. You were talking about the difference in, you know, sort of like increased dollars and particularly uh, supplemental payments. Can you explain yes. yeah. you know, that angle and how that actually is a, a far better scenario for us than just extra dollars that popped into the budget? Yes. So on top of the normal calculation we do under Prop 98, what was committed to during last summer's budget uh, conversation is the governor came up with this idea of these supplemental supplemental payments that we would get in education that were that turned out to be very significant dollars going into the future and and I called it sort of the consolation prize we weren't sure the state would ever even be in a fiscal position to ever make good on the commitment but it had two parts to it one was giving us an additional amount of money into whatever we got under Prop 98, that would equal 1.5% of the general fund. And we would get that amount of money till we got up to the point where we made up the difference between, and this is kind of a little bit of green eye shade stuff, the difference between test one and test two. It would be roughly you know, between 12 and $13 billion of money that we would have augmented to us. And again, it was in the face of having to do these big deferrals. The governor said, we have to make an ongoing bigger commitment to education and we're going to make this promise that we're going to do that in the face of the damage that might be done short term. We're going to try to make the future bright. The second part of the supplemental payment concept was to say that beginning in 22-23, sort of phased in between 22-23 and 23-24, those fiscal years, we would shift from a roughly 38% uh, calculation of money that comes in the general fund that goes into Prop 98 to a full 40%. And a lot of times we round up, we talk about Prop 98 being roughly 40% of the budget. This would make that number sort of real. And that has a cost to it, to the state's general fund. It increases the base. And what have we all been talking about in K-12 across the last few years? How do we get that base up? The governor would decidedly be putting the base up. And you take a look at the out year uh, graphics that the LAO puts into the report, and you'll see that there are these exponential increases in education funding in the next few years that are led by the supplemental payment. The supplemental payment in most of those years generates more money than just the normal growth of Prop 98 without the supplemental payment. So it is a really significant dollar figure. And then just sort of to finish off the conversation on this update, um, know that the circumstances for education as outlined by the legislative analysts in their report yesterday puts us in a better position than the governor's budget was proposed to give us before there was covid so you roll all the way back to that january budget this news has a prognosis for us that's better financially for education than that january budget uh last january so really good news if it sticks. And I totally agree. Randy Bassett is the quintessential, you know, CBO now superintendent, which is I'll believe it when I see it. So we'll wait and we're going to be lobbying fast and furious over the next uh, 30, 45 days to get us a proposal that actually aligns with what the LAO is doing. Well, I think uh, I, everyone who watches this regularly will say this is probably the best news we've had in quite a long time. Uh, and and we'll talk a little bit about stimulus, but I believe that you know not having to pay back those deferrals. We've been talking about how you know potential stimulus would get wiped out uh, by making up for for those gaps. And if those gaps don't exist, that could actually be uh, you know have the stimulus have a, a larger impact on schools. So you know we'll dig into that in a little bit. But I want to jump back into discuss the, the one time monies and it it this just pure coincidence. But our team uh, basically put out an article this week, which is. One time monies on technology, the do's and don'ts for education leaders. This is something that is uh, very easy to sort of get caught up in spending dollars on things that won't last. And really, the spirit of the article is like, what should you spend your one time dollars on? 
we said there may be some coming. There's certainly some uh, potentially available still through the CARES Act, which may, uh, you know, the, the December 30th deadline may move. But even if you're trying to, to meet that deadline, you know, what should you be focused on? And I think, you know, we had some wonderful contributors on this. Uh, Pam Hernandez, Executive Director of Q, uh, folks like Brian Olson, the cybersecurity consultant for digital advisors was, was in there as well. Uh, we had some CTOs chime in. And 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 we had, of course, uh, Randy Bassett was kind enough to share. So, Randy, you you know, when in, I believe with your contributions, you were focusing on spending dollars that go beyond COVID, right? So you can address current problems, but you need, really need to be looking at the long term. Could you just expand on some of those points that you made uh, for folks that haven't read the article yet and why they might want to check it out? I think really looking at how we move forward, particularly in the area of technology, which we are so reliant upon at this point in time. You have to think about what those long-term costs are. Um, we tend to think, okay, we bought a computer, that's the cost, we've taken care of it in the future. But if you look at analyst firms like Gartner out there and they look at what truly are those costs, you have to figure in things as far as where the cost of employees. Um, what is that support cost going to be? And really, even if you look at those laptops, whether it's a Chromebook, a laptop, they really, the cost of keeping them around um, the optimal replacement cycle is about two and a half to three years. Once you go beyond that, the cost goes up in all those other areas. You think about the support, you think about the employee time that's lost. Even more important now, what is that student learning cost? So making sure that we make those investments that go into the future um, and give us agility moving into the future. We know one of the things that's going to drastically change and continue to change is our reliance upon technology and data. So we talk about things like internet of things and connectivity. We think about what that's gonna mean in the future. We need to continue to build that infrastructure. So while a lot of people in, in Fontana included have purchased things like hotspots that provide that support, it really doesn't address that infrastructure. So how do you make that investments that are gonna be paying off five years into the future? 10 years into the future and benefiting your students instead of reacting to a problem. Otherwise, you end up spending more money in the long run and putting in more of a constraint on your on your services for your students. Thanks, Randy. And I think the you know, one of the other themes that we we dug into was really not keeping old systems alive. So you you mentioned, you know, keeping old devices beyond three years actually costs more than replacing them. And you know, there's some data and things to, to back that up. But I would say, you know, obviously the old systems that you have that are built on paper, passing around from people, uh, storing documents, those kinds of things, those are places to invest dollars in now because you're gonna come out the other side with the ability to make decisions, get approvals faster, and then save money long-term without having to do all that document retention. Uh, so, you know, just, just keep some of those big things in mind that you might wanna address, thinking about that long-term. Can we come out the other side with lower costs and the ability to do more leveraging modern technology? I think the other thing that we, we've discussed in there is things like professional development, building playing the trainer models. How about a long-term PD plan rather than just sort of buying a bunch of stuff and deploying it and hoping that it works? And Pam Hernandez and, and the, the Q community, she brought a lot of great wisdom in there. Um, but you touched on it when you were talking about older devices and you know cybersecurity, IoT, and it just happens that, uh, you know, the, the federal government has uh, a bill basically going to the president's desk that is built to address minimum standards for Internet of Things, anything that's connected to the Internet that's within your district. And I think that is actually a very positive thing. We've seen some state legislation in California around data privacy, but this is really around devices and privacy. And what I would say is if you don't know what the oldest device in your network is, if it's a printer, if it's a security camera, uh, you know, if it's a, a, a some screen that connects to the internet, if you don't know what the oldest device is and if it has any level of security, there's a layer of risk there. So, you know, Randy, we talk almost every week about cybersecurity, you know, federal government's warning people, FBI's warning people about ransomware attacks. Every time you open the paper, there's a new attack or hack. Uh, and this is becoming a bigger issue. Can you talk about what that means to you the risk of those old devices, because they hear me yap about it enough, but as a, as a sitting superintendent, former tech director, former CBO, where's your mind on, on the old devices, Internet of Things, and security? Today, we rely so much on that connectivity and maintaining those connections, and every device is an asset, but it is also a threat, so you have to balance those things out. And if you think about those older devices, 
they didn't have the knowledge at that point in time. And it was even a different world, how you approach security. I remember back in the day, as far as looking at how you even approached, you know, viruses, it was a signature based. It was, how do we recognize this particular virus as it comes in? We found out, okay, that really doesn't work. We have to look at recognizing traits and adapting to those traits. So um, our hardware manufacturers or software manufacturers and those standards have changed over time. And if those standards have not been changed, it is a threat to shutting down some of those other things. Um, there are the additional costs of maintaining that as well and what your IT staff has to do and what they are forced to do to maintain those types of things. So making sure that we have that continuity and that everything and all of our resources go back to our students is so important. But right now, especially when we have the vast majority of the state on distance learning at this point in time, and some districts have dealt with this as far as the superintendents are staying up at night. Okay, what if the internet goes down? What if my connectivity to my services? Um, what if Zoom goes down? What if, you know, what if Teams or what if Google Classroom goes down? We have to maintain those connections because if those connections are not maintained, it's the same thing as your school shutting down for the day. So making sure that you have that replacement going on, making sure that you know what is in your ecosystem of um, your school district and technology infrastructure, how you're gonna maintain that is essential so that you can maintain services and connectivity and hopefully grow into the future for students. Well, thanks, Randy. And I think one of the things that, that I've noticed in my time helping school districts with tech is there's a lack of awareness of what is out in their network. And if you've recently deployed thousands of more or hundreds of more devices, and we're talking laptops, hotspots, um, new network equipment in the district, it could be something you put in place for uh, you know, measuring temperatures that connects to the internet. Your, your um, number of things that you need to worry about has just expanded. And if you didn't really know where you were before, running a new type of assessment in today's world of like what's connected, how old is it, you know, really analyzing that, this is a great time to do it. You know, you may not have the kids back on campus yet. It's probably gonna be a little bit faster and easier than it would have been in the past. And it's definitely a best practice to really understand where you are. So you can even try to establish a minimum level of security, a minimum level of expectation uh, uh, of your devices. So, you know, I think that's a really powerful thing. And, you know, Randy, you brought up connectivity. You are in a wonderful position of being able to uh, investigate building out your own network. I know it's an initiative of yours so that people can learn in the community at any time, in anywhere. But can you talk about you know, the spirit of that, what that means for you, and maybe how some of the technologies have evolved to allow that to even happen today? One of the recent technologies as, that has evolved is something that's called CBRS, which is a cellular network that we've headed down the pathway as far as establishing within Fontana a cellular network that we can guarantee a purpose-built network. We want to know into the future that as students connect additional devices, it's going to be safe, they're going to have the flexibility to build, and we're going to be able to connect without those additional costs going on. As we looked in our community, and many communities are in this situation, that we found that the even the cellular infrastructure within our community was not sufficient to provide connectivity throughout our community that's going to serve our students. So as we looked at those costs of bringing in and having outside providers provide, whether it's a hotspot or some of those other things, um, or paying for a connection into the home and providing that for students, it was much more cost efficient for us to build out our own infrastructure. So we're doing that as a partnership with the least infrastructure and moving into the future, we know that that is going to reduce costs in the future. Um, we found that it was a little bit cheaper to build our infrastructure currently, but once you get past that five years and the, infa, the initial five years and that infrastructure is built out, they cut our costs in half overall as far as what we're going to be paying for connectivity. We suddenly had that mind shift um, throughout the state that students are learning and they can learn any place, any time, and virtually any pace. And it's not just at three o'clock, learning shuts down when the school shuts down. We need to be able to provide that connection and break down those walls. So it's not just about connectivity now within your school and within your local infrastructure. It's how is that a strategic plan heading into the future and within your community and even crossing over communities. And it's something that's pushing some school districts. Um, I was even contacted by the state of the New York and they have a reimagine New York campaign uh, through the governor's office. 
and they're looking at building those things and how do you reemerge out of this pandemic, out of these struggles, and how do we learn and actually reemerge stronger and prepared to face the future. So it's very challenging sometimes when you're when you're dealing with a lot of the challenges that are going on out there, new requirements coming down, reacting to threats of the coronavirus, but we really need to take a step back and say, okay, how can we learn through this and five, 10 years down the road, be in a better situation and invest our resources in something that's gonna have those continual re returns. We tell our students that all the time when we teach them financial literacy. How are you going to invest into something that's gonna make a difference in the long term? How do you plan for, for your future? In technology, we really need to invest in that infrastructure within our communities as well. Well, thanks, Randy. And I, I guess you should add consultant to the state of New York to your LinkedIn profile, because I would say that's pretty impressive and uh, glad that you shared that. Another, again, a wonderful example of spending money, one-time money on a long-term solution, which would be providing connectivity to community anywhere, anytime. Uh, with that, you know, Kevin, we've talked a lot about uh, the stimulus and, and unfortunately, it seems like we've backpedaled a little bit or a lot, unfortunately. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, you know, the stimulus likelihood today, maybe some time frame, and uh, just w what are your thoughts on that based on what you've heard? Yeah, and I mean, one of the natural questions I think a lot of people have is that if California has figured itself out of some of the toughest problems that we've had from a fiscal standpoint, as a result of COVID, what does that do to the incentive for you know Congress to do anything? Well, understand right off the bat, nobody's doing thing, anything in Washington, D.C. to try to help out California. So the fact that our circumstances improve don't change the politics around stimulus at all. If we get it, we're going to get it because there's a national imperative to do it. And we will have, obviously, an advantage if we actually get those additional resources on top of obviously improving economics here in our own state. Most states don't have the kind of lopsided tax structure that we have. They have a, a little bit more balance in their overall revenue system and they really are hurting. And the state and local governments need this support. And it'll be a real advantage to us in California public schools, as well as to the state if we end up getting a stimulus package eventually. But I think you're right, things are just sort of sliding backwards on this, although I was encouraged this week that Senator Cory Booker, the U.S. Senator from New Jersey, did introduce a, a major measure that again had, uh, you know, an amount of money north of 200, I think it was 240 to 260 billion dollars in it that was aimed at education in particular to try to further mitigate COVID impacts. That would obviously be terrific if we're able to get our share of that money if it came through. It also changes a little bit of the political dynamics back in Washington, D.C., which is one that says all the stimulus talks are framed by a negotiation between the White House, Nancy Pelosi, and House Democrats. It injects sort of a, you know, a leader amongst the Senate, the U.S. Senate Democrats to say, you know, we've got a plan of something we want to do. It's obviously focused particularly on education. It's not a broad, comprehensive plan. Uh, in the meantime, the president-elect has doubled down on his urgency. He just underscored it this week that Congress take action on HEROES 2, which is that House package led by the speaker. Um, and I'm not sure what his view is, will be about the Cory Booker plan, but it all goes into the mix. I think you've seen some of the same you know, prognostications I have about maybe possibly something not being done till sometime into January, but January, the paralysis could potentially get worse. It also could get a lot better. Um, it depends on those Georgia seats in the U.S. Senate. Democrats will need both of those seats in order to take control of Congress on both houses of Congress. And if that happens, which I don't think is likely, but if it were to happen, then obviously we get stimulus and it's not a problem. But I think it's a problem for us if we don't get something enacted before the end of the fiscal year. And Jack O'Connell, who was with us the last time we were together on this broadcast, was saying that, you know, he he was getting communications that out of the uh, majority leader's office, this is Mitch McConnell's office, that his overall metric for what that stimulus package ought to look like was just dramatically smaller because Democrats have really lost their leverage. So post-election, you know, he's at a trillion or less. Uh, that's way below what the Heroes 2 would have, you know, provided. 
and significantly less than what House Democrats had envisioned when they introduced the HEROES Act to begin with. So we keep chipping away at it, seeing what's happening. You know, the president-elect's trying to do what he's doing. I think when the Electoral College gets done doing what it's expected to do um, in the first week of December, maybe we'll start getting people focused on other issues. But until once and for all, the presidency issue seems to be resolved by the Electoral College, we're not going to be able to see a lot of progress on anything. Okay. Well, thanks, Kevin. And, and, and uh, Randy, I know we're, we're a little bit over time here, so hopefully we don't keep you from something really uh, uh, pressing. But I just wanted to ask you a quick thought on this, because we talked about the FCC chairman, what that means. I, it's something we bring up on the show frequently, but what is that FCC uh, chairman position? If, if you know, Like, obviously, Biden's going to be able to pick his own chairman. What does that mean for schools? Uh, what have you seen the impact of the FCC uh, up to this point in, in, uh, as superintendent? One of the biggest areas of technology funding that we receive across the nation is the E-rate program that provides for connectivity. And one of the things that was cut several years ago was that connectivity as far as hotspots, things like that, that say cellular connectivity. So picking somebody that has an interest in building infrastructure, that community infrastructure that we talked about, looking at where we are today, because traditionally at the FCC has looked at things strictly within the buildings of schools and not looked at that connectivity. If you had connectivity that you're providing at home, it was actually looked at something that was negative and would be deducted from your E-rate funding. So having somebody that looks at things from a holistic standpoint that's gonna to provide to schools and the infrastructure, communities for infrastructure, is going to be key for moving us forward in the 21st century, not just within the school system, but within our country. So it has potential funding ramifications within schools, connectivity and some significant equity um, meeting within our within our nation. Well, thanks so much, Randy, for all that. And thank you for being a guest this week. Uh, Kevin, I did forget to mention, we mentioned it last week that December 1st, you've got a budget update, you've got the state controller, state treasurer on. We're gonna put the link to that in, uh, you know, basically under this YouTube video. We're also gonna email out some of the articles we discussed uh the the article that we published this week that both kevin and randy contributed to and uh and we'll we'll any other related links we'll have in the bottom of the video and we'll be emailing out as well so i want to say thanks to both of you uh kevin we're looking for more good news next week as more of this unfolds and randy best of luck to you handling all the turmoil this year keep up the great work and glad to have you both on great thank you so thanks again for joining us for another week of this broadcast and i just want to take a moment to remind you if you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel and share this out over social media. Again, you're our marketing team. I'll also finish by saying, if you have some questions, please send them our way. We'd be happy to address them on a future broadcast. So with that, thanks everybody and we'll talk soon.